Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. So, here were some problems with it. First of all, there was a provision in the trust, and this, these kinds of provisions are very common. And so, if you have an irrevocable trust, especially if it wasn't drafted recently, but was drafted a while ago, this provision may be in there. And by the way, there is no grandfathering here. The fact that you did this irrevocable trust a long time ago uh, and it's now going to get reviewed by somebody doesn't make any difference, right? If it's got a defective provision, as the caseworker said that this one had, it just can get invalidated, right? So one of the problems was that the grantor, the person, the older person who created the trust, um, retained a so-called power of appointment during lifetime. That was, that means, the power to say regarding the assets that are in the trust, um, well, I know that I can't have them myself, but I'm retaining the power to name somebody else to get some of those assets, like one of my kids, right? And the, and the caseworker, supported by the administrative law judge, said, no, if you've kept the power to say, to, to say that the money can't be released without your consent, or to name the person to whom the money can be released if it's in trust, then for all practical purposes, you still have control of that money. Now this is a classic, this is a classic, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Whenever you do these mass health cases and they go up on appeal, they'll actually quote the Supreme Judicial Court case which said that. You can't have your cake and eat it too. This kind of provision has been pushed in the past by elder law attorneys who've said, well, you know, you know, you're going to put your money in trust, but you're not really going to lose control over it, right? Because it's going to have to stay in trust unless you say that it can move out and you get to name who is going to actually move the money out, right? And who it's going to go to. So really, you can just make sure that with kind of a wink and a nod between you and your son or you and your daughter, that you're going to transfer some money to your daughter from the trust and they're going to give it back to you, right? And that's what this caseworker was getting to. Can't do that, right? Um, there was a provision in there specifically that's, that authorized the trustee to purchase annuities for the benefit of the person who was in the nursing home. Now, the, the, the stream of money coming from an annuity is income. It's income to the recipient, right? So this caseworker said, well, if the trustee has the power to purchase an annuity, what the trustee can do with any assets that are in the trust is they can just go sell those assets, get cash, and use the cash to buy an annuity. So really, the older person does have access to that money. And that's the legal standard. The legal standard is if the older person has, if there is any way that the trustee exercising the trustee's discretion can get the money to the older person, the trustee has to do that, right? That's the rule. Even if by doing that, they are sacrificing the interests of the other beneficiaries, typically the kids who are going to receive the property after they die. So, specifically said they can purchase an annuity, right? There is a provision in there, it was, it's called, it's a property replacement provision. This is a provision that is there primarily for federal income tax purposes that I won't go through. And it, and it says that the, that the older person, typically called the settlor or the grantor, has the right at any time to trade to give, to take property out of the trust, even though it's an irrevocable trust, and replace it with property of similar value, put other property of similar value back into the trust. And what the, what the, what the caseworker, once again, supported by the administrative law judge said was, well, if, if the older person in that case can do that, if they can just take some cash or other property and give it to the trustee in return for the house, they can still get the house. Now, th this, the reason why I mention that is this is a classic case of a lot of these trusts, what, what happened in the past was um, people who were drafting them would take a trust which had been used for tax purposes 
and simply modify it to use it for mass health asset protection purposes without really paying attention to make sure that there wasn't anything in there that, that was there for tax purposes that was going to screw up the mass health asset protection. This one does. And so I mention that to you because if you've got one of these, you want to look and see if that provision's in there. Because if it is, you want to get rid of it. You really want to get rid of it. Um, finally, there was a provision that said that, that, um, that following the death of the older person, um, the, the trustee had the, the, uh, the power to pay the estate taxes of the, um, of the person who had died. So there were these provisions, and, and the decision of the, of the appeal of, of the administrative law judge did not just like point to one of these and say, that's the one that was wrong. He pointed instead to all of them and said all of those put together meant that the older person, the grantor, kept too much power. Now, I want to compare that to another case whose name I can't give you because it's not, it hasn't been appealed yet, um, in which another trust was presented to a different uh, a, 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 um, ad administrative law judge. Once again, the caseworker had said the trust was no good and it went up to an administrative law judge. In this case, the trust was found to be okay. What was, what, and what was it, was it, and when I look at the two trusts, what, how, where do I see the differences? Well, the first and obvious one was that in that trust that was deemed to be okay, the, the older person did not keep any control or any right to either name somebody who could receive any money or any veto power over anybody that might get money. I think that's the most important. Um, in that case, the grantor, the older person was, did continue to be allowed to live in the house. It was as if they had retained a life estate in the house, right? Um, substi So-called substitution, you know, that provision that I just said, say, that I just talked about saying you can pull property out if you replace it with other property, that was in there in this case. And in this case, the, 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 the trust was silent about whether or not annuities could or could not be given. So in that case, this guy got a good break except that um, the decisions of the caseworkers and the decisions of the administrative law judges are not binding on each other. There isn't like this precedent system like you always hear about in court, you know, like if a judge finds one way in one case, all the other judges have to find the same way, right? Well, that's not how it, it works among these administrative law judges. They're, they're all considered to be equal. They all make their own decisions. They're all, the, all their decisions get independently reviewed by superior court judges. So, the question is, the question is, do you want to take a chance? And that's the only reason why I'm raising the issue. If you have an existing irrevocable trust, um, do you want to take a chance that it now contains provisions that may get you in trouble if you end up needing it? Now, if you do, of course, you would typically say to yourself, I'm nailed, right? Because it's in an irrevocable trust and the trust can't be amended, right? So what am I gonna do? I know now that there are these problems in my trust, but I'm not, I don't know if I can get out of that, right? Well, the answer to that is so that, I gave you the bad news about the fact this trust was cha challenged. There is this good news. There are these two mechanisms that have recently come up that allow you to actually amend an unamendable trust, an irrevocable, unamendable trust. So if you want to change your trust, you actually have two ways of doing it. First, there's a method called decanting. Decanting. Who thinks of these terms? I don't know. Um, so this, there, was a, there was a case that came down last year. It was a case actually involving the Kraft family in which the, the Bob Kraft had set up a series of trusts for the benefit of his kids that had certain tax benefits to it. And because it had these tax, in order for him to achieve those tax benefits, he had to make everything irrevocable and unamendable. Um, but then the tax code changes and changed and he wanted to amend some stuff, right? Um, and so what his trustee did is in, he didn't amend the actual trust document. Instead, and this, by the way, this actually happened two or three years ago, but it finally made it to the Supreme Judicial Court last year. Instead, what he did was he created a brand new trust that had all the correct provisions in it, and then he exercised his discretion as trustee to transfer all of the assets to the brand new trust that had the correct provisions. That's called decanting. You kind of 
take all of these assets and you put them through this little purifier and get them to the, to the other side where supposedly now they're, it's in a nice safe little jar and you can drink it or you can, you know, you can uh, use the money. And, but, but his lawyer said, well, you know, you know, we think the trustee has the power to do this, but there's nothing on this that says that we can in Massachusetts. It is true in other, so we should appeal this. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Judicial Court because there was plenty of money to spend on lawyers. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Judicial Court. And much to the astonishment of many of us, the Supreme Court said, that's okay, you can do that. 